I don't believe I have any uh, conflict of interest to declare, and I don't think I have any potential bias uh, in my presentation. So let me move on. So Lyme disease, we all know, is the most common vector-borne disease in the US as well as in Europe. And uh, it's really a fascinating disease because it's caused by the spirochetal organism, Borrelia burgdorferi, and related organisms. The disease, the organism, is actually very distinct from common bacterial infection. So you have staph or urinary tract infection organism. These, when they relapse, when they have persistent, you know, uh, chronic persistent infection, when they relapse, you can see the organism. But with Borrelia infection, the Lyme disease, when the patient relapses, you can't see, you can't be cultured. The organism cannot be cultured. I think this is really a unique property of the organism that creates a lot of confusion. Uh, it's a unique feature of the disease. I think it's important as a microbiologist, I need to bring this up. Uh, the other thing is that the organism actually, as it grows in different phases, actually changes the form, changes morphology from the spirochetal form to round body form and also to microcolony aggregates. Uh, like a biofilm type of structure, okay? So as well, under stress conditions, they change morphology as well into round bodies, into cyst forms, into biofilm-like structures. These are much more resistant to antibiotics with different stresses. So I'm gonna come back to this. So because the organism is very strange, very peculiar, it has these morphological changes, it actually can, oops, how do I go back? All right. So, oh, I don't have a pointer, right? Uh, right, that's okay. So, because of the organism changes morphology, each time they change morphology, it changes antigen, protein antigen expression. That actually confuses the immune system and you get various antigen changes each time the morphology changes. So that creates a problem for diagnosis, for treatment as well. And also, it has a very diverse heterogeneous disease expression. I think this is also related to the very unique feature of the organism that is it tend to change its shape, ch changes morphology. So at every stage and turn of the disease, uh, if you look at them, it's never straightforward, okay? It always goes up and down, never linear, okay? So this is a very distinct organism in this sense that is, uh, we are really dealing with something very complex. We're not quite used to, not like a common bacteria, okay? So I think in this sense, it is important to remain open-minded, okay? There are still lots of things we don't know about this organism, okay? If you look at the Lyme disease, the disease has various stages. The early stage is a localized EM rash stage, then moving on to early disseminated form, as in the case of Bell's palsy or uh, carditis, a late stage of the disease, arthritis, and the PTLDS. So it's a continuing spectrum. Okay, so at the early stage of the disease, it's relatively easy to cure. Okay. So the current IDSC guideline is a two to four week of antibiotic treatment with doxycycline, single drug doxycycline, or amoxicillin, or cefuroxime. So if it doesn't quite respond, then the late stage of the arthritis, sometimes people use IV ceftriaxone, okay, because it's a stronger antibiotic. Uh, but then when it's uh, reached the stage of uh, PTLDS stage, the current treatment doesn't work very well, okay? So I'll come back to that as to why. So I think the most controversy surrounding Lyme disease is because of this disease condition, PTLDS, okay? So it's defined, I think, as it's alluded to by previous speakers that it is actually a disease condition despite standard antibiotic treatment of Lyme disease these patients continue to have symptoms six months after the treatment. And Brian Fallon actually uh, mentioned some of these clinical studies of these clinical study, uh, trials, treatment trials of these, uh, so I'm not going to go to specifics except to say that some studies demonstrate 
activity of the antibiotics, whereas others did not. So, but it is really quite interesting. If it's, so this actually suggests something that has to do with persistent infection, because otherwise, how come antibiotic would have any effect, right? If it does, if the organism is not there or it's not a persistent infection, antibiotic would have no effect, right? Well, they have, they have placebo control there. But it also says, especially the, the Dutch study, the Dutch police study, is actually says only two things. One is that the current antibiotic does not work very well, okay? It does not say, well, because the current Lyme antibiotics, as I will show you, has limited activity against the persistent form of the organism. So the PDLDS is like uh, you know the elephant in the room because you know e even though some people who recognize they try to ignore it because there's not much one can do about it because it's not in the guideline. How do you treat such patient is really a challenge. So what causes PDLDS? There are different theories, different possibilities. One is that is actually uh, immune response to antigenic debris. The other is uh, autoimmune disease, and then the other has to do with co-infections. And in some cases, due to secondary, maybe opportunistic infections, even due to prolonged antibiotic use, somehow related to that. And then it's uh, you know, residual damage to tissues. Uh, the last possibility is the antibiotic resistance or persistence due to the organism not responsive to current antibiotic. And there is no FDA-approved protocol for PDLDS treatment. As a consequence, pe you know, patients try all sorts of things and don't work very well, and that the, these patients suffer, and it's really a huge cost, um, you know, incur very large uh, health costs, about 1.3 billion, and yet they don't work very well. The, here I'm gonna share with you some evidence for persistent infection, okay? Where, you know, this being demonstrated in different animal models, in mice, in dogs, and in monkeys, where after standard treatment with Lyme antibiotic, you have this persisting organisms. In the sense of a molecular test by DNA test, but not culturable. The organism can not be cultured. This has been a very unique feature of the disease. That's why I think the, some uh, more conservative physicians would not really recognize this. So they would say, show me, show me where the organism is, right? As I said, it's a different organism. But then, it, you can't quite culture it, so it's in a state of a viable but non-culturable form, okay? Science on that is still meager. It, we don't quite know very well. What is the molecular basis for viable but non-culturable dormant form of the bacteria in any organism? In fact, it's a type of persistent bacteria, okay? So there's been recent interest uh, from USCDC as well on the persistence issue um, as they increasingly recognize this as a problem. And as well as, uh, you know, human studies uh, by at NIH by Adriana Marquez has showed that xenodiagnosis, which is based on the tick uh, bite of the patient after antibiotic treatment, can pick up Borrelia DNA, but again, is not culturable. But the DNA, you might say, well, the DNA is not the organism, it's not viable, right? But if you put DNA, dead DNA from dead organism into the tissue, they degrade it very quickly, within a week. But these persist months and months after antibiotic treatment, in the case of animal models. So really suggesting it's something, it's actually there, the DNA is there, persisting, it's a very likely a sign of persisting infection, but you can't culture it. But the very intriguing study is uh, done by Steve Bothold group that's showing the sense of a resurgence phenomenon. I think this is really very interesting. It deserves a lot more attention. That is, the, this is the mouse experiment. So they treated uh, Borrelia infected mice with a 30 day of ceftriaxone. So then they monitor the treated mice uh, stop the treatment, monitor two months, four months, eight months, and 12 months. So within the first eight months, you don't see anything. If you survey the infected organs, different, uh, different tissues, you don't see anything by molecular test. 
However, at the end of 12 months, okay, sorry, you started to see this molecular test turning positive. This is really a late resurgence phenomena. The where again it's in the form of a increased DNA detection, DNA content that really suggests that the organism actually replicated in a state yet not culturable. So this is really a very interesting phenomenon that really suggests that something analogous may happen in vivo, but we just can't culture it. So it turns out uh, not only in vivo antibiotics, current Lyme antibiotics cannot quite eliminate the Borrelia organism, but in vitro as well. We and uh, many other groups have actually demonstrated that current Lyme antibiotics have good activity against the growing forms like uh, you know this log phase culture, but have very poor activity against this stationary phase culture, which is enriched in persister forms. Okay. Then the concept of the bacterial persisters. So persister is nothing new. It's been shown before uh, since 1940s when penicillin became available. They show that always is a small percentage of bacteria that not killed by penicillin. So these actually not due to genetic resistance, but due to phenotypic resistance. That is the organism in a dormant state, when you remove the antibiotic, they come back, and when they start growing, still remain susceptible to the same antibiotic. So it's a phenotypic, more subtle resistance in persisters, okay? So in fact, uh, this persister form is actually underlying different bacterial persistent infections like tuberculosis, urinary tract infections, I believe in the case of Lyme as well. So you might wonder why are persisters important, right? I'm gonna show you this cartoon uh, where this current Lyme antibiotics or antibiotics like this mower, it chop off the top part. I know uh, when people see this, they always laugh because it's such a uh, you know, very good <laughs> way to demonstrate the problem. So the mower is the current, Lyme anti current antibiotics that kill the growing form of the bacteria. The root is still there, remain intact. When you remove the antibiotic, they grow back, okay? Even though you can't quite see it, oftentimes in the case of Lyme. So what you need is drugs like this, <laughs> like a shovel that dig out the root, okay? Then the whole thing dies. In the case of tuberculosis, I'm going to give you this very important drug called parazenamide. Okay? It's a persister drug like the shovel that dig out the root, then can shorten the TB therapy. In the field of tuberculosis, where I originally came from, we know the importance of parazenamide, PZA, because it's a persister drug, inclusion of which is critical for shortening the therapy, without which the therapy is longer. That's why in the TB field we know the importance of persistent drugs. I think the same principle applies for Lyme treatment. So this is actually in the form of a yin-yang model. So here, in the case of tuberculosis treatment, we use three drugs, parazenamide that kills this yin-yang. Yang means growing form of the bacteria. Yin means non-growing form. So we have a TB drug like azanaz that kill only the growing form, then rifampin kills both growing and non-growing form, then parazenamide exclusively kill the non-growing persister form. So you need the three drugs in combination, in the case of TB, to more effectively cure TB, because single antibiotic like azanazid, in the case of TB, people did in the 50s, took 18 months to cure TB, okay? But with the drug combination, treat TB six months. This is exactly because of the heterogeneity of the organism in vivo, such that single antibiotic does not always take care of all different bacterial populations. So that's why we need drug combination. But it's not any drug combination, because if you only use the drug combination that kill only the growing forms, different antibiotics that kill the growing form, it's not as effective. You need to take care of this persister population. So, but uh, unfortunately, when we started, we don't have this type of antibiotic in the case of Lyme disease. So we had to really develop a high throughput, high, uh, cyber green viability assay that allowed us to screen FDA-approved drugs against Borrelia persisters. And we were able to identify a range of FDA-approved drugs that have high activity, better activity than the current Lyme antibiotics 
against Borrelia persisters. So these include daptomycin, used to treat MRSA, as well as clofazamine, used to treat leprosy, as well as MDRTB. By the way, clofazamine was recently endorsed by WHO for treating MDR tuberculosis, being able to shorten the TB treatment from 18 months to nine months. It's actually analogous here, clofazamine, we found also have good activity killing the persister form of Borrelia. So then along with some other cephalosporine antibiotics. So these studies were recently published in the past year or two uh, in different journals, so I'm not going to go over in detail. Um, so while we evaluate these drug candidates, we found, in fact, among the current Lyme antibiotics, the most effective one that actually can be assessed by our Green PI viability assay are the cephalosporin antibiotics, like ceftriaxone, which is very interesting, correlate very well. That actually had turned out to have better, the best activity against Borrelia persisters. In addition, close to that is cefuroxam, which is the third Lyme antibiotic, which is not very commonly used, very peculiar. But these really turn out to have very good activity against Borrelia persisters. It may be interesting to evaluate the third antibiotic, cefuroxam, also called ceftin, in clinical setting, because it shows pretty good activity against persisters. With this assay, so we were able to rank the relative activity of the current Lyme antibiotics as well as the new drug candidates we identified. But of course, the new drug candidates we identified are much more active than the current Lyme antibiotics. So even that, we found that there is a hierarchy of Borrelia persisters, starting from the spiroketal form, which is actually more easily killed in spiroketal form, even though it's a persister, non-growing form, is more easily killed by the drug candidates we identified, then followed by round bodies. The most resistant form is an aggregated microcolony or biofilm-like structures, which are single persister drug like daptomycin, clofazamine, are not able to kill entirely. So you would need drug combination. Okay, in order, a similar sort of story as I alluded to earlier, you need drug combination to take care of all three different bacterial populations in order to achieve this more eradicative cure. Uh, well, this is all done in vitro, of course. So as you can see here, uh, yeah, unfortunately don't have a pointer. But, but anyway, so as you can see here in the middle panel, this aggregated structure in green means live cells. So this is stained by under microscopy by a cybergreen PI assay. The cybergreen stained the uh, green live cells green, dead cells red. So the red is stained by PI, propylene iodide. So with this uh, very visual assay, we're able to quickly determine the relative activity of antibiotic against the persister form. You can see the current drug like doxycycline hardly had any activity against the aggregated form. It's still green, that means still viable after treatment, whereas daptomycin, the very uh, right-hand corner one, is actually a lot of cell turn red, but still some green cells, okay? That means on its own had limited activity. So when these daptomycin used in combination with second drug is actually better. You can see more red cells, but to achieve complete eradication, you need three drug combinations. So doxycycline, uh, cefaparazone, as well as daptomycin. The three drug in combination is able to completely eradicate so that we don't get any regrowth during the subculture studies. So this is a subculture study shown by actually the very, very bottom one, bottom right hand one is the one that's the best drug combination where in subculture study, nothing grow back, no spirochetes, okay? Whereas any other single drug or two drug combination, they all have spirochetes growing back. So that means they're not as good. So more recently, we did all this uh, evaluated the different uh, persister drugs, including daptomycin, mitomycin C, as well as uh, uh, donamycin, anthracycline antibiotic. Uh, 
it's actually quite interesting because in another study, some study claim um, mitomycin C had better activity than daptomycin, but it turned out not to be true because when you use a younger culture, then you can see mitomycin C more active than daptomycin. But for older cultures, primarily consisting of persisters, in fact, it's the other way around. Daptomycin more active than mitomycin. So we show that in drug combination as well as um, in subculture studies, these are able to completely eradicate these triple drug. Again, it's a triple drug combination being important. Okay, two drug combinations, not, not good. So I'll have things grow back. So I'm going to skip that. So f finally, I think I moved to this uh, unified yin yang model. So it's really quite amazing to see the polarization in a field where you know the IDSA guidelines seem to be actually more geared towards this uh, relatively early stage to this late Lyme arthritis stage of the disease. Beyond that, this two to four week antibiotic do not work very well. Whereas the eyelids seem to sort of a more taking care of the physicians, uh, sorry, taking care of the patients that are not taken care of by IDSA Lyme physicians. Okay, so this like this, uh, but you know both are groups are important. This sort of a continuing spectrum of the disease, I believe. Um, so in order to actually more effectively cure this Lyme disease, I think more studies are needed to evaluate uh, these drug combinations. Um, so my question then for the future would be whether the drug combinations that eradicated this microcolony biofilm-like structures are active in vivo, in animal models as well as in patients, okay? And what are the causes for PTLDS, okay? When the role of this persistent infection, I think that now it's possible to address that and also, when we address that, it's important to recognize the heterogeneity of the patient group, PTLDS, so, so that actually they may have more than one condition. They, they are not mutually exclusive, may have more than one conditions in that particular case. Um, so then, what would be the biomarkers that predict uh, treatment response as well as cure? And also, what is really the basis for this viable but non-culturable form of Borrelia persistens, and whether we'll be able to design drugs that are better kill such forms, see whether they can improve clinical treatment of the persistent form of the disease. Yeah, so I think finally I'm gonna end this two quotes. So one is from William Osler. Um, I think this is very important. We really need to remain open-minded, and I'm really pleased to see this sort of flexibility coming from the IDSE line of physicians that are beginning to recognize the issue of persistent Lyme and that recognize and that we don't know everything. And there are still many things we don't know. Uh, it's important, that approach is important, because otherwise, if we claim we know everything, that is dangerous, okay? We tend to shut ourselves out and we're not really, uh, not going to be very helpful and they're only going to make the problem worse. So I think, you know, to end, I want to really quote William, o William Osler, who was at Johns Hopkins, but by the way, is from Canada. <laughs> Probably many of you don't know that. So, so the greater ignorance, the greater the dogmatism, as well as from Willie Bergdorferi, who discovered Borrelia. In the context of persistence, he made this comment. It is there, but you can't see it. So I'm going to stop and <laughs> see you again. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.